Michelle Singer. I'm the adult programs coordinator here at the Keller Covered Library. We're so pleased to have you with us tonight. Welcome to the library. We're very happy to be co-sponsoring this, this series of talks with the Montpelier Senior Activity Center. Uh, and I'm happy to have Janet Claire from the Montpelier Senior Activity Center come up and introduce our speaker. It's wonderful to see a packed room, and thank you for, for Kettle Cupboard Libraries um, co-sponsoring the series and also hosting tonight. I'm pleased to announce that three of our other speakers for the next three events are also in the room tonight, which is exciting. Um, the last speaker is not, but the next three are. And um, the, the next three talks are happening on January 27th. That's going to be um, cultural observations from a month in Japan with Peter and Therese, who are here in the front. Um, on February 10th, we've got On the Edge of the Arctic. That's going to be looking at Canada with Barb and Whit Dahl, who are here also, back there. And then on February 26th, Bill Dolger is going to be speaking about Incredible India. It's fairly recently back, and, Bob, and Bill is right here. Um, but tonight, we're going to be traveling to China, Korea, Cambodia, and Nepal with Justin Turcott, who traveled um, in 2019 with his entire family. They, uh, he and his wife took their kids out of school for a number of months, and they had an incredible adventure all over Asia and Oceania. He's going to tell you more about their itinerary. Um, and Justin has had a special relationship with the Senior Center for I believe seven years, going on eight now, as um, the contractor for our Feast Nutrition Program. So just, if you've had lunch at the Senior Center, or someone you care about has, um, Justin is the master chef behind the Feast Program, and we've been really grateful for that partnership. Um, Justin also served for uh, on the Montpelier City Council, and is active as are his uh, the rest of his family in many community affairs. And we're so grateful that they're willing to share their photos and their stories with us for this third event in our Off the Beaten Track series. Um, I also just wanted to recognize a couple more people who helped make this series possible. <coughs> Mariah Lane is uh, the brainchild behind the name and the, a lot of the planning that went into it. Mariah, where are you? Thank you, Mariah. Thank you. And Barb Smith also helped in many ways with the logistical uh, planning of the series. Um, I did. Thank you, Barbara. I did bring um, a number of posters that are in the back. If you'd like to grab one before you leave, and that summarizes the rest of the events as well as some that have taken place already. And I see Barbara Gartney, one of our earlier speakers, is here too. Thanks for coming. So without further ado, I'd like to turn it over to Justin, who has fabulous stories to share with you. Thanks, Justin. Thank you all for coming out on this cold night, and thank you, Jana and Michelle, for helping organize this and get it all set up. Um, you'll notice on the back table there's a scrapbook uh, where I've collected a bunch of the tickets and little pieces of paper that I tend to hold on to and then mail back in packets from time to time. And uh, considered also bringing some uh, s snow and ice samples from the top of Everest, but <laughs> I figured you probably had enough here. <laughs> Um, we're honored to be able to share our experiences and we realize that we're privileged uh, to be from a first world country where pretty much anyone who puts their mind to it uh, has the both freedom and the means to travel the world. Uh, we don't take this for granted um, and I acknowledge this because um, the majority of people on earth uh, still do not have that privilege. Um, also, just a little bit of uh, bits and pieces housekeeping before I get right into it. Um, any uh, facts or statistics uh, I sourced exclusively from Wikipedia. Um, this is an online crowdsourcing resource online. Um, I did that so that um, there'd be one place I could go back to. If you have any um, concerns about these facts, please come to me because it, it can also, you can go back into Wikipedia and request or edit make edits to correct any inaccuracies. Um, and I would encourage you all to uh, consider visiting or donating to Wikipedia as it's a great um, online crowdsourced uh, piece of information, way to get information. 
Um, everything else in the presentation is just first person observation um, or um, deduction. Um, questions, um, I'm the sort of person that loves to uh, ask questions as the presentation is going on so they don't get lost. So please don't hesitate to throw up a hand if you see something or you're wondering and want to get a little more detail. As best I can, I'll recognize people and answer questions um, as we're going through the presentation. Additionally, there will be question and answer at the end of the presentation. So if you're more comfortable waiting till the end, um, I'm happy to spend as much time as we need to to try to answer any questions that folks have. My greatest hope tonight is that this inspires you to go out and travel and that you feel a little more like you were with us on this trip by the end of the night. Um, in terms of an overview of the evening, I'm gonna first, I'm gonna talk a little bit about um, how we got to where we are today, briefly, um, and then talk about where we went. I have uh, four folders of slides that are um, set up to run for four countries, Korea, <coughs> China, Cambodia, and Nepal. Um, after that, um, I'll you know, be making, as we go through those pictures, I've tried to kind of organize them in terms of, uh, well, being a chef, of course, there's lots of food pictures, <laughs> thanks to my daughter, Annika. She was our photographer on the trip. Um, the people, uh, the sites, but you will probably notice that um, while we took a lot of pictures of cultural icons and World Heritage sites, um, I didn't spend a lot of slide resources highlighting those. The reason being is that um, there's plenty of better photographers and videographers who've done ex extensive documentation of many of these sites, and I would encourage you to, if you're really interested in learning more about pandas or the Great Wall of China, to watch some of those videos. What I hope to give you is more of an overview and specifically because, um, let's see, so except with the exception of Korea, my wife and I had visited the other three countries about 18 and 15 years ago. And so going back now, what really struck me in the, the title of this talk, uh, Time Capsule, The Velocity of a Changing World, uh, comes from the conclusion that um, uh, I hope to share the, uh, the, the idea that um, the world is changing incredibly fast. And, and please do not use Vermont or the United States as your metric for how quickly the world is changing. That's what I was doing prior to going back to China, Cambodia, and Nepal. And um, it's not an accurate yardstick to be using on the world today. So uh, I hope to shed some light on that. And then, as I said, answer some questions at the end. So this was our family as we uh, prepared to depart the U.S. and introduction to eating three meals a day for the next eight months uh, prepared by someone else. Here's Nicholas eating one on the plane. Um, the airline, of course, was uh, very well appointed with all the modern conveniences. And we had made some preparations prior to departure uh, in terms of getting the kids backpacks, Um, where they could pack the items that they wanted to bring on the trip. They were going to be responsible for carrying those packs, and Michelle and I did the same as we had on our previous three trips. All right, question already. Yeah. That's all you brought? That's correct, because uh, if you have to carry much more than that, it's really a burden. It's hard to get around. It also stops you from going a lot of places you otherwise might be able to. And were the climates all the same? No, most of the rest of the world, they sell the clothes that you, you, know, you can buy whatever you need when you get there. And um, the ATM card, if you have a, an ATM with a Visa logo on it, you can access the local currency pretty much anywhere in the world now. It used to be when we started traveling 2000, 2003, even as late as 2011, um, you needed to have a backup or we spent hours and hours in India in 2000 trying to actually get local currency. But nowadays, it's, it's quite simple. All the, global banking system has made it incredibly easy to just use a U.S. bank account to transfer money where you're going. How old were the children? Um, they are 12 and 14 now, so they were 11 and 13 at the time. This was last year. We left in the late summer and then came back um, in the spring so they could rejoin their class that they had left after spring break. Um, this was uh, my uh, shot, screenshot to help encourage myself to keep my, uh, get my weight back under 100 kilos. 
Um, and so I documented that as soon as I landed to see what would happen. And I have to tell you, as a chef, fortunately, there's a lot of good food out there, and uh, I, I wasn't all that successful. <laughs> so we landed in Korea, and um, we were on, a, on an island uh, off the coast of Incheon. Um, so Korea has uh, basically become a first world country. It has a GDP per capita, which is a benchmark that I use to just kind of get a measure of how much disposable income people have, because it varies quite a bit around the world, um, of about 40000 per person. And so um, this, it's a first world country. They're, they're able to... This is South Korea. Correct. Yes, thank you for that distinction. It's a great point, too, because Korea used to be just one country, and there are a lot of Koreans who still have loved ones or family members who are on the wrong side of a line, either north or south. And uh, many Koreans really wish for reunification. I knew very little about Korea prior to going, other than that uh, we ended up getting a very affordable airfare there. And um, so it's because, as many people, I'm sure you know, I didn't because uh, when I in high school history, we ran out of time before we got to the Korean or Vietnam War. Um, but they, um, many people wish that they could be reunified. It's Russia, China, and the U.S. Um, that are in Japan that are kind of making that difficult for them. Um, so in Korea, you have um, both old culture and new culture um, together. And they've grown quite quickly in the last 70 years. Um, this is a Korean barbecue. So this is a style of eating. Everyone sits on the floor for most of their meals in Korea. And you'll see this um, shiny uh, pipe is uh, actually a, a hood vacuum that sucks the smoke from this incredibly hot charcoal fire where they put small pieces of a variety of different high quality meats uh, to be cooked and then cut up at the table. You'll also see in, in Korea they have what's called um, Banchan. So they have lots of little dishes of small things that you don't order. They just come like bread and butter would come at most restaurants in America. So, and it, depending on the restaurant, you always will get at least three, but sometimes you might get eight or nine small dishes of just little side dishes. And of course, you can't forget to mention kimchi because this is their national dish. And again, thought of it more as kind of a little too spicy for my taste, having tried it a couple times in America. There's a huge variety of kimchi in Korea. Um, and from regionally, they go from very mild to and pungent and spicy. So again, you'll see some more traditional architecture, but also seeing all the high-rise buildings, as in many of our cities, you'll see an old cathedral with high-rises all around it. So sort of an indication of we've kept this small piece, but we're also a developing or developed nation at this point. And the kids had a chance to um, get involved with some local uh, traditional art, and this gives you a sense of what the living space is often like, quite Spartan. Korea, of course, is here on, uh, between China here and Japan here and has been uh, kind of a battleground for the last several thousand years as those two powers have made moves to go back and forth. And so they share a good deal of both of those neighboring cultures in their own. This is, setting is very much like what you'll also see in Japan, and we'll hear more about from Peter and Therese. Uh, this is a more traditional section of the city that was preserved, and you can see the old clay roofs and hutongs, but also the high-rises that have developed all around the rest of city Seoul. Seoul. Um, and then there's a couple oddities. These are, uh, the people of Korea love seafood, and everywhere you go you'll see live seafood. This is a, it's a sea worm that's known as either a mother-in-law worm or a penis worm. Uh, but it is considered a delicacy, and uh, people will cut that up and eat it. Uh, no, that was a little bit... <laughs> The, the squid I'll go for, oh, I, we uh, were able to try lots of fresh shellfish, regular fish, that one, no. Was it alive? Oh yeah, those are, they're, they're all wriggling around and they have teeth too inside the, these little holes. If they open that up, there's these sort of bizarre, really sharp circular teeth. It is, it's a really, yeah, yeah. Kind of, 
but pretty much everywhere you go, you'll see fresh seafood in tanks. So there'll be glass tanks, these are squid. Every kind of fish, shellfish, they love fresh seafood. Uh, this is our introduction to how to communicate in countries because everyone pretty much knows what this means or, you know, this or you know, this. Um, but w in this case, we were um, working on getting, what were we having to Kinko's. We had to try to find a Kinko's copy to make preparations for our Chinese visas. And so we were trying to explain this to this man in a stamp making shop and we had started using Google Translator which for those of you who don't, who don't know, has a couple really helpful features for international travelers. One is the text to text, so you just select the language that you're talking in and then what you want it to come out. You talk and then it prints it on the screen and then says it both and prints it in their language, which is super helpful. The most amazing one for me was when there's another one that is like a reading feature. You turn on your camera, you hold it up to a sign or a menu and it, you tell it the language that it's starting in and what you want it to come out in, and literally before your eyes, you watch the characters just go Tsh! and change into the English words. So that was a new one to me. It was pretty, very helpful, especially with menus. Agree, agree. But bet much, much better than zero, which is what I get looking at most uh, Asian characters. So you got the copies made? We did, eventually. <laughs> and we got the visa applications, which was just, was as harder, harder. Uh, virtual reality, so Samsung and uh, many other leading technology com companies are located in South Korea, and so we went down to the tech center and did, took, a, took this for uh, a drive. It was my first time ever trying that, and it was an incredibly immersive, incredibly powerful tool that I'm amazed hasn't been adapted by more people uh, globally. It's, uh, it's an amazing experience. And, of course, the, the, the primitive toilet has been elevated to a much higher standard. This is your control pad uh, when you go to use the, 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 the potty uh, with a variety of um, music and hot air and washing and spraying of different places and cleaning and lasers and all sorts of things. So you just got to try to decode it because if you push the wrong button, you may be in for a surprise. <laughs> Korea, South Korea's imperial palace uh, certainly rivals uh, China's uh, in terms of its um, grandeur, and here's a quick shot of that. K-pop, another highlight of Korea, so they have these uh, usually fairly large boy bands who are, are all the rage both in Korea, Southeast Asia, and worldwide to some degree. And at that point we decided it was time to head across the Yellow Sea. My wife, Michelle, had, uh, before we had left on the trip, decided that the best way to get from here to here was to take a karaoke ferry. So we got on the Golden Bridge Five <laughs> and made our way across the Yellow Sea. It took about a day and a half. One of the interesting things to me was that there were very few passengers on this enormous ship. Um, mostly, we saw tractor trailer trucks driving into the hull of the ship, I would say at least 50, maybe many more. It went on for a couple hours of loading. And they didn't unload their cargo, they just drove in there and stayed in there. And when they got to China, they drove back out again. So there was quite a bit of commerce going across this sea and some of the people we met along the way had done quite a bit of shopping in Korea, bringing back goods that were unavailable or prestige luxury goods that are either unavailable or much, much more expensive in China. Mostly, we saw people even like, several people all just with bags and bags of cigarettes, Korean cigarettes, selling them or bringing them to somebody as soon as they got off the boat, first black market trade, basically. Um, this is, we were in Korea two weeks. We went to Japan for about 10 days, which I'm not even gonna touch because you have another presentation coming up on that. And back in Korea for another week or two. So about three, four, three, three weeks-ish. And we arrived in Tsingdao, China. I'm going to just switch folders and bring us, hopefully. Justin, how much did you plan ahead and how much did you just improvise as you went along? That's a great question. As I mentioned before, uh, my wife and I have taken four uh, international trips of six months or more, two with our children. Um, and the way we really like to do it is um, to just buy a one-way ticket. We find that's the best way to 
get just get the ticket, you know you're going to go, and then you have to start thinking about, well, what are we going to do when we get there? Or how, what do we want to do? Um, a couple exceptions would be, country, you know, you have to do some visa research because certain countries like China are quite strict on their visa process, and so you actually have to present yourself in person to an embassy before you get to China or bef so that you can do that. We debated going down to New York for a couple days to do that in a consulate and elected to do that in Korea. So we, we applied while we were in Korea, came back a couple weeks later. Uh, but the application process is, is really um, quite a bear. They want to know everywhere you're going to be every single day, what you're going to do that day, where you're going to be staying. So they really asked for quite a detail. It was a, maybe 20 pages per person, more. Um, quite, a, quite a process. Did you know all those well, no, we didn't. So, <laughs> so, but you have to have reservations that match what you're saying. So we ended up making a whole bunch of reservations and then canceling them once we got there. <laughs> but the visa is good for 10 years. So we could go back. After that, they'll probably be like, well, you didn't go anywhere. You said you were going to go. <laughs> and, and they know exactly where you go. I'll get to that in terms of state surveillance a little later on. Um, so China, in, you know, has been this he, just rocketing economics from an economic standpoint success story. Um, to give you an example, the GDP in 1978 was $153 per person, and that's per capita. Um, or, and in 2017, is 10, 000, over $10,000 per person. So you've seen a meteoric rise in terms of the standard of living more people have been lifted out of subsistence agriculture and poverty than probably any time in human history over, over the last 50, 60 years in China. Um, so that increased standard of living has uh, resulted in a number of things. And this was a country where we had been 18 years prior. And so we were able to kind of see that. And uh, it was frankly shocking, um, almost undescribable the amount of change that we saw from when we were there in 2003 to what we saw this time. Uh, so this is pretty typical cityscape. Um, and you see, this is the, they have a pretty standard model when they build new cities in China now. 25-story um, high-rises, uh, most everything conforms to that. And they'll just build one after another and after another. You can't see the full size of Tsingdao here, partly because of the air quality, even if though it is on the coast. Uh, m not all, but many Chinese cities uh, still have significant air quality issues. Is that just a foggy day? Um, it's a little bit foggy, but it would not be uncommon for visibility to be similar or worse than this um, in major cities. And there are <laughs> dozens and dozens and dozens of cities of two, four, six million people that you probably never heard of. Um, larger cities are 10, 20 million people, like our major cities. Now, most of the high-rises here, um, residential or business? You know? That's, well, most of the 25 are residential, but you'll see like a little bit of style here. You know, these are, so there are probably some that are businesses as well. This is an old historic port city, so there is quite a bit of old town here with European architecture from uh, Germans and other people who had come to this place to trade and established colonies there back mostly in the 1800s. Um, this picture reminds me when we were getting off the ferry, and this was really uh, kind of an introduction to uh, communist function and, and bureaucracy. And you're managing to try to guide a state of 1.3 billion people. Um, it's not an easy job, and so you have a lot of rules and regulations given how quickly things are changing. It's probably quite stressful for people that are living there. And this, there's a funny little story. When we got the, the boat pulled up, you know, right here, and the, you know, the gangplank comes down, and basically, right, right here, there's a bus. And everyone had to, you, it was, we were all in line. So I'm like, oh, great, here we go, you know, we're, we're in line. And as you can imagine, there's, Several, I mean, a lot of people on this boat. They would load us into the bus. The bus would drive down this road, turn around, and pull up right over here. 
And so you're just thinking like, well, that's kind of weird. And it's, it's it, and I, the only conclusion I could draw is it's either sort of an introduction to like, no, these are the rules and no matter how silly they may seem, you're gonna follow them or you're not gonna get in. Or there just been so many problems in the past with people getting off the gangplank here and walking over there, they jump in the water or they'd try to run away. I don't know what would people would, I don't know why, but it was just sort of eye-opening to, to remember that. Now, cars in China are a lot smaller. Um, <laughs> and that is a child's car, but adult cars aren't much bigger. <laughs> and so you'll see, that's another part of this change is people are going from walking or riding bicycles, which was pretty much everyone when we were there before, there were no cars on the highways, to m gas powered motorbikes, and then increasingly electric powered motorbikes, and aspirational to cars, including all the best European brands. And you see a lot of those cars on the road there now. Is this pink car, uh, the one that you just had, is that electric? Or um, I'm not sure if it's gas or electric. There are some electric vehicles. We, you know, because Beijing was hosting the Olympics a few years back, there was a big push to clean up their air quality. It was horrible when we were there before. And, you know, we, we would hear a lot of sort of anecdotes and stories from other people who were either working, expats in the country or tourists. And what they were saying is, yeah, they got rid of all the two-stroke motorbikes in Beijing. They issued a proclamation and you could bring your old bike down and get a brand new electric bike. And if you didn't, then your social score would start to go down and eventually you'd be arrested and your bike could be taken away. But they don't just send them to the scrapyard, they load them into container boxes and ship them over to Africa where they're doing massive infrastructure and development projects and as they're building that brand new railroad and road into the mines and the resources of Africa, they're giving away these old motorbikes. So they didn't really take it off the road, even though Beijing's air got a lot better. Another form of transportation, you still see people hauling, you know, by bicycle or small electric or motor powered bikes, large amounts of garbage and recycling. Again, small vehicles, regular vehicles and bicycles all pretty much share the same streetscape. And this is be a pretty typical four lane, five lane street um, with automobile traffic and public transportation as well. Also not at all uncommon to see subway and uh, train, surface train service in cities. Um, this series of shots focus on transportation. This was the, the bunks in the trains. We took several overnight trains. Train travel incredibly affordable in China. Many, many people still use the train system. Um, and you would sleep three on each, uh, three high on each side and gives you some sense of the size of the compartment inside. Pretty standard looking trains, unlike Japan, which had a very, very modern rail system. Now reading the uh, sign to figure out which train you're supposed to get on was a little more challenging. Keep in mind, they keep cycling too, so just about the time you figure out what those characters mean, usually changes. <laughs> and bicycles are still very much in use, but this starts to give you some sense. This is just a, you know, a typical, you know, popular sort of nighttime spot in a city, but there's, I don't know, a lot of bicycles. People, you know, there's a lot of people, a lot. Um, and now we're kind of transitioning. So we started um, right on the coast and we wanted to try to get out towards where the Silk Road was. So we traveled several days to come out towards the deserts of Dunhuang. It's about two thirds of the way towards Urumqi, which is at the far western part of China. Um, and a lot of the, um, the people aren't there. And so we would travel we traveled by train to get there, and then lorries once we were there. And, of course, by camel as well. <clears throat> it's, it's quite vast, similar to probably like Nevada, or um, there are also dunes there though, large sand dunes. And what you see in the foreground of that reddish color, these are all raisins, or that the, they're grapes that they're just drying in the sun. Um, to make raisins. This area also, because it was on the Silk Road, was for hundreds of years, people were traveling back from between the East and the Middle East and the West towards Europe. And um, so these are Buddhist monks' graves and they're all over out there. They were, they're, you know, I wish I had a picture that showed more of them, but there, you can see there's two more in the background. 
They're not at all uncommon and they range over several hundred years. Some are very, very simple, others are quite elaborate. And they're all just out there for you know, miles and miles and tens and tens and tens of miles. And this was a, an older, uh, looked like a, must have been a house. I think it was built of bricks and mud, um, but it was, it, just looked incredibly old, and so you could tell that people had been out there and traveling through here for a very long time. These are uh, an interesting landform called yardangs, and it's uh, they're rock. They're quite large. You can see the pe there's a person for scale, um, and um, th we took a bus trip to see some of these. It's kind of an interesting ge geological feature. These are those raisins up close. And we also found a couple genie bottles. <laughs> so because the, they are referred to as gin, it's spirits of the desert, and they either help or pester travelers. And so we were quite excited that we'd found those. And a whole bunch of quite interesting rocks and mineral samples. As you may know, China is one of the world leaders in producing rare earths. And it's not surprising as you trek around these deserts, just all sorts of strange stones. We found all these ourselves. Uh, tried to post them back, uh, not permitted so that you're asked to present your passport and they literally open your box and go through everything before they'll put the tape back on that says approved to, from any post office, state controlled post office. And they raise their eyebrows about the computer chips that contain photographs like these. Um, metal, nothing metal. So there we had like souvenir coins from Mao's tomb or something that those weren't allowed. So we kept all this stuff and we're carrying pounds and pounds of rocks and metal <laughs> down to Nepal and posted it from there, but it never arrived. So. And the kids, we hiked up into the dunes. And so they got a chance to kind of climb on these massive sand dunes and Higher and higher, we, you can see the tracks going all, you can climb these ridges all the way up to the top, so. How much was it? Uh, not hot at all, actually. We were there, that would have been, what, like October? Was it October when we were there? So it was kind of fall, and it was, it's like a desert, it's kind of hotter in the day, it does get hot in the day, but we went, I think this, that was pretty early that we were up there. And again, this is sort of, it, I, I put this picture in here because it's, it's sort of a good reminder, like this idea that, you know, the party decides for everybody what is going to happen. It's not like, I don't really like grass, I'm sorry, like I'd prefer not to cherish. No, you are obligated to cherish the grass. And if they didn't have this little fence here, the thousands of people that walk through here would probably have trampled it a long time ago. So, I mean, there's a reason, but then if it's all, it's just this sort of, it kind of captures that feeling of ultimate state control over a sort of fleeting resource. Again, they're working hard to make sure that everyone understands the importance of public hygiene. They've made great strides, although some of the toilets are still pretty bad. This was on, uh, you know, this is in public, but people, needed to be told, apparently. <laughs> this is pretty typical in terms of queuing and lines. You can see this is the, the front of the line right here. And the line goes out those doors and around the corner for a long way. And there you can see how closely people, they don't have the same sort of uh, lining up and queuing and personal space uh, expectations or standards that most West, first world Western countries do. It's very much when this gate opens, there is a rush like the beginning of a marathon but with more intensity and people are getting knocked down and trip and everybody's trying to rush to get on the train because once the seats are gone they're gone it's not like you're gonna you have to wait a couple hours maybe get to the next one it's that same sort of communist you know it's, we give it away for free but you don't always get it so you line up and you wait and you push in the line and this is uh, one of the last, it was in, another interesting thing we noticed that had changed was uh, when we were there before, you would see sort of a typical amount of homelessness, begging um, and sort of sideline entrepreneurialism like this uh, in the major city, as you would in pretty much any major city. This time when we went back, I think there was only one person who was begging. And so millions of people have been deployed to do something else. They're not allowed to be homeless anymore. 
they're not there, they're not, I don't know where they went, but they're gone. It was shocking. And even things like this, like just, I need to make a few extra bucks, you wanna buy a mouse? <laughs> Here, bubonic, want a plague? Um, <laughs> Um, another typical kind of city, you know, this is very typical. You'll see just lots and lots and lots of high-rise buildings and roads. But you do have some older hutongs and smaller two, three-story uh, communities as well. Those in are um, increasingly just being relocated. So even if your family had been there for hundreds or thousands of years, um, if the state says, puts up, you'd see posters from time to time in areas that say, you know, you have till 2020 to leave. And after that, we're going to make you leave and bulldozed high rises. But they'll give you a new high rise somewhere else, as long as, you know, you want it. Yeah, this was nice. I don't know the answer to that. Um, you see, I'm trying to think, you see people definitely working into old age. I don't know if it's by occupation or, I mean, my impression was there was definitely sort of a strata. If you're a party member, well, their, their whole education system is working you towards this test, these placement tests. Kids are studying so hard. I think it was one of the best things for our kids to go there to see that Oh, kids aren't like, you know, on their phone or don't want to go to school. They're like, it's, you know, eight hours a day. And then you go to four hours of enrichment after school, six days a week, right? And you're not goofing around playing sports. You're studying really hard to get a good score on these exams. This has been the case back to the days of all the emperors. They had this series of tests where if you are smart, you get pulled into the party. So they're kind of skimming off the best and brightest to keep the party strong. Um, and once you're in the party, then you pretty much are, you know, you have responsibilities, but you definitely have distinguished yourself uh, from the other 80% of society. Um, so that was sort of interesting to, to see the, you know, the party members driving around in really nice cars or having meetings. They all drive like either black or white cars, so you can tell. It's just, it's, you can see that it's a thing. Um, Cranes, a lot of new construction still happening. We saw this when we were there before. Um, I remember being in Beijing prior to the Olympics and I think counting 20 cranes operating 24 seven, just building, building, building. It's still continuing, um, but you can see the last 15 years worth of progress that they've made. Also, um, riverbank armoring. So they're, um, well, they do have a green buffer there of trees, that's all complete cemented and paved because of frequent flooding and just with that many people you have to finish. Here's another shot of kind of just I think people leaving a bus or train station but those residential buildings are incredibly typical. You would see those almost everywhere you go. There are of course still historic structures that have been preserved um, generally in the centers of cities um, and in touristy areas. So again, just kind of typical cityscape. Oh, I have a question. Yeah. Uh, did your kids um, get stopped and want people to take your pictures with them? Yes. Constantly? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Yep. Your Westerners are still quite novel, and they're very curious about us. And they're also very, very um, interested and insistent about practicing English because they recognize that being fluent in English is a huge advantage in a global market. Um, although more people speak uh, Han Chinese than any other language in the world right now. Um, so food and beverage. Um, like most of the rest of the world, uh, the Chinese don't have any particular stigma or puritanical history that um, you know, is a very kind of restricting alcohol consumption. So you'll see in uh, Singdao, for instance, there's kegs on the street everywhere. They make tons of beer there. And you can fill up plastic bags or containers and just walk around with beer if you want. No one really minds. Um, <laughs> Peking duck, of course, one of my favorites. We're going into a series of food slides here. Now, dumplings were pretty much the staple food. And Nicholas was appointed the dumpling dictator. And his job every day was to find dumplings. <laughs> and you see um, the bautza and the jautza, um, two different styles of dumpling. This one being kind of a more puffy rice 
unit, and these are sort of more what you think of as Asian dumplings. Yep, stacked steamer baskets, and you just tell them, I'd like four bautza and however many, or jautza and bautza, and they just bring them, and when you eat those, they just bring more if you want them, so. A little bit of soy sauce, dipping sauce, and they come in a variety of different shapes and colors and sizes. Those are, uh, I think, black squid ink dumplings. Um, this was a delicious eggplant dish. It had like this sugar, kind of a hard caramel on the outside of it, and it had been, you know, cut into baton and deep, quickly deep fried. Just absolutely, it's really nice. A little bit of chili flake too there. Now, another big change is when we were in China before, meals were always rice, large amounts of rice, and one or two or small, unless it was a banquet, a small amount of protein, and it'd be considered extremely rude if you took anything before you took a large portion of rice and had a small amount of vegetable and protein garnish. That has completely changed. Now, animal protein is widely available and affordable to most Chinese, and plates like this that are 50% more beef are the first things that come. Some restaurants don't even serve rice anymore. What about noodles? I remember them making noodles on the street. Definitely. Noodles, noodles available too. I've got a shot of some buckwheat noodles. Um, but mostly meat, you know, has become, it's a, they like the taste of it. It's a prestige. They, it's affordable now and they're consuming huge amounts of animal protein. And they're getting bigger. Yes. This is a, a, a fungus dish, black fungus and pork, I believe, with some green peppers in there. We used to often find just sort of these candied peanuts, but with a little bit of fresh red onion um, or green pepper, kind of as a side dish, but just a nice way to kind of add a little crunch and sweetness to a meal. And of course, I mean, more dumplings are in the background, but um, rice is still available. Um, in this case, it looks like they've mixed some meat into it. This was a shrimp hot pot. So Szechuan hot pot or hot pot dishes are quite popular where they'll get a pot, they'll bring you ingredients and then you put the ingredients into the pot and usually with liquid and kind of cook it yourself at the table. Oh, we also um, Chinese very much into sort of the whole more like there, this wouldn't be at all uncommon to see the whole head shell, the shell on the shrimp. Um, that would be pretty typical, same meat on the bone, a lot of these cuts, you're getting little pieces, but there's still a bit of bone in there because they really relish that connection to the source of the food. They have really great cuisine there. A noodle dish, um, some glass noodles here and vegetables again. And then you get into some of the more exotics. So these are scorpions. <laughs> and some sort of larval, large insect creatures. <laughs> And they're still alive. They're wriggling around up there until they dunk them into the boiling oil and hand it over. Food on a stick is quite popular, and you'll see in either night markets or uh, daytime markets where they're specifically set up to sell small bite-sized pieces of things, portions of things, like those scorpions or cotton candy desserts. And it would look, a pedestrian way, it would probably look something like this. You can see constant presence of both uh, street cleaners and then police in any sort of um, busy night, you know, social area like this. Um, here is a more sort of simple soup. This was from out in the desert. I believe it's donkey soup. Um, again, served with dumplings. Uh, here was a kind of a strange one. These were like, uh, Annika, what, what was, you were the one that ate these. Um, what was the, the texture of the ball itself? Was it like doughy or? Well, they were pretty crunchy and then they dip them and then dry ice and make them really cold like that. Oh, and then they make them sweet? So when they hand you the cup, it's got this sort of smoke coming out of it. And then when you pop them in your mouth, you get this big puff of like frozen air <laughs> coming out. <laughs> Um, this is fruit, so they'll take a lot of care in terms of presentation to, you know, cut off the top and segment. I think this is grapefruit or similar citrus. A simple buckwheat noodle dish. Question about noodles, and so noodles are definitely available and common as well. Roasted chestnuts became one of our favorites and are available almost everywhere. So uh, kind of like a sugary mix with this little black beads that help them toast uniformly, so they're really perfectly cooked. and of course, served warm in a paper bag. 
and there's all variety of stuff that you're really not sure what it is. It's on a stick, it looks kind of shiny, and sure, we'll give it a try. <laughs> Here you also see the presence of an, uh, some other Western tourists. This is the Szechuan hot pot, and I will tell you, this was one of the spiciest things I've ever eaten in my life. And they have, this is the outer moat, then this is supposed to be like the safe zone. <laughs> And you get platters of different things. In this case, here's a couple types of mushrooms, but vegetables and noodles or tofu and meat or seafood. And you just kind of drop all this stuff into this. It's heated from below. So it's on your table. It's an inst installation on the, every table. And it's uh, kind of bubbling hot. And the more stuff that you're adding, the more flavorful that broth is getting. And you never really know, you see how you're like dipping in here and just sort of fishing around and pulling stuff out. So you're putting in the stuff you like and it's sort of like swirling around and other people, you know, you might get it, you might not, but <laughs> it all is quite an experience. Although um, it is so spicy, it's unbelievable. They put tons of Szechuan peppercorns are different than uh, like Western pepper in that you're actually, your whole mouth goes numb, like you're in the dentist's office. Like I'm not exaggerating, the first time I ate one, I'm like, I think they drugged my food. <laughs> um, and of course, lots of Szechuan chilies. Um, and here you can see also, there were cans, like uh, soda cans of uh, sesame oil. So they, they put like, I don't know, six or eight on the table, which just when we sat down and I'm like, well, what are we gonna need this much oil for? Well, it helps to, with the heat. So you're dumping, you're taking it out of the liquid and then dunking it into like a bowl full of oil so that your palate doesn't get completely anesthetized by the rest of the spice, and it's hot. It's a good question. Uh, they are very industrious in terms of agriculture. You'll see like two or three rows of garlic planted between just buildings even. Like, there's huge fields, but much of it has to be imported now. And so Australia, um, New Zealand have outlawed political activity, foreign ownership, because Chinese companies were coming in, buying up large tracts of arable land, bringing in tons of Chinese workers, building an airstrip, building a farm, massive, massive farm of garlic or shoots or bok choy or whatever they wanted, putting it all on the plane, flying it all back to China. And Australians only being 19 million people, uh, China could give off 19 million people and not even notice they were gone. So they got a little nervous about that. And they've radic ra rapidly and radically changed their laws in regards to foreign investment, foreign ownership, and politics, because they were showing up with briefcases of money and saying, oh, I think this deal should go through. And politicians were saying, yeah, that sounds pretty good. Um, also, um, that whole region of Southeast Asia. So you've got China here, but this whole part, not India, but right here is all very, in here really, um, it was subject to Chinese influence. And I'll get a little more into some of that in a minute. Do you know what the impact has been on Madagascar? Because they were coming in there quite a lot when I was there. Mm. I wondered if they went that far. Probably, I'm sure in Africa there's major inroads both for um, mineral resources yeah. and ore and coal and uh, arable land, I'm sure, and also cheap labor. Because as Chinese wealth grows, nobody wants to work the third shift in that factory anymore. I want to go skiing. They're going to open a couple hundred skiers this year. So they need to find, they'll move the factory, and now that they have the capability to supply the rest of the world, those jobs will go to Africa, which will, of course, raise their standard of living as well. Vegetable dish, bok choy, very, very popular. And they have nice rest, you know, this was a, quite a touristy restaurant, but, you know, they, they take quite a bit of care. They really like food. Dining is really an experience. Sharing food communally at a table from a Lazy Susan is, is quite traditional. There are always a lot of delicious menus, and the people who run the restaurants are by far some of the most hospitable and kind people I've ever met. This was a probably almost a basketball-sized piece of citrus, sort of like a pomelo, but larger. So they have some sort of exotics. And paying the tab, you know, for quite a luxurious dinner, like this one, you might pay $20 with, and this is, I don't know, a dozen or more dishes and drinks. This was an example of uh, tourist or Western food. 
So we've got uh, spaghetti bolognese and a couple pizzas there. <laughs> And uh, American beer products are there as well, as are $60 bottle microbrews, if you want one of those. Bubble tea, also a daily popular item, and regular tea. Coffee is also gaining popularity, um, although it's still seen kind of as a luxury good, but increasingly affordable to majority of people. More stick food. dumplings and repeat there's a golden carp so the, again they'll often serve fish on the bone fish with the head dried fruit mangoes and I put this slide in here not because it's dried mangoes particularly exceptional but just to sort of um, illuminate the transition from like the raisins, we're drying all these grapes on giant burlap cloths in the middle of the desert, some of them, you know, sandstorm comes, whatever, to now, you know, branding and a pretty well put together package being marketed for Western prices to on a domestic market. Did milk come in a bag? Uh, many, many Asians are lactose intolerant, yeah. and so milk and dairy products, not popular, no. hardly ever see them, it's certainly is available. Yeah, they'll put it in a bag or Tetra Pak or, um, but bag is not uncommon, you're right. These are small sour apples coated in caramel. It's sort of a Beijing stick speciality as a, as a dessert, kind of sweet and sour. And embryonic poultry is also a delicacy. So they'll um, let them mature to some degree in the egg and then open it and then cook them or eat them raw with a spoon sometimes. Squid, seafood, also popular. And I'd put a couple packaged foods in here too, um, just as examples of um, how they're becoming much more Western. Snake. <laughs> and sausages, a variety of different stick foods. Desserts, also in grapes, strawberries, dragon fruit on the bottom, and then some sort of a soft serve ice cream on top. Lizard. This was a delicious dish. It was, um, it was like a mushu pancake with Peking duck in it, and it was just a little piece of small street food. Absolutely just delicious. This was a fellow who befriended us and brought us into his restaurant and proceeded to serve us a multi-course lunch and give us a tour of the kitchen, um, and mostly seemed quite keen on getting his daughters to come to the US somehow. <laughs> Now we're in the um, Imperial Palace in Tiananmen Square, and I'm afraid these slides might be a little mixed together, but they're pretty much right next to each other. And this gives you some sense of the sort of detail of um, some of the sculpture work. Um, this is um, the entrance to Tiananmen Square, and you can see Mao's portrait still prominently displayed there. Um, the access to the square itself had changed a lot in the last 18 years. All the, I don't, we don't seem to remember any sort of fencing like this, and there's a lot of fencing now, a lot to kind of help keep and partition, and you can't get into the square except through controlled access points, um, which you're subject to facial recognition and searches, et cetera, to get in to this public space. This is a great example of sort of the, just the growth and the excitement in terms of, um, Chinese productivity. This is a flower display. It's made all of synthetics, metal and, and fabrics and textiles. And they were putting it up in honor of something that weekend in Tiananmen Square. But the literally the size of this thing, I'm like, you're doing this is your idea of a flower display, okay? <laughs> like these these little tiny those the stems of the flowers are like six inch steel pipes. Okay. Um, it was pretty impressive. There you can see it from a distance in Tiananmen Square. Um, Beijing, again, and some of just, just of course, as I said, I'm not going to show you tons of slides of the Imperial Palace or some of these touristy places, but I picked just a couple just to sort of show like the incredible, you know, attention to detail and craftsmanship that went into some of these sculptures. Lots of gold and carvings. 
This is inside the Imperial Palace, so traditional um, Imperial architecture. It was a forbidden city, so you weren't allowed in there unless you had some business in there with the emperor or his court, or this, you know, the court. And heavily, heavily decorated both outside and inside the buildings, surrounded by a moat all on all four sides, so you would have to swim and then climb that wall to get in there. Um, lots of gilding and just, again, incredibly intricate decorative work inside all of the many of the buildings in the Imperial Palace. Again, sort of these myth mythical beast, sort of half dragon, half turtle. And we came across this a couple times. You know, you start to see these patterns as you go travel around the world and go to these museums. And I, for some reason, I'm always kind of in, intrigued by uh, the blending of animals and humans or, or cross species animals and, you know, the centaur, all these sort of m mythical things. But you. You see this all over the world. It's not just you know Greek mythology or the unicorn. You see icons of these all over the world, and so I, they're kind of interesting. This would be kind of a typical crowd load for the Imperial Palace, so it stays quite busy. Part of that is um, every resident of China gets an ID card, um, which is matched with their biometrics. And many of the to do any traveling or when you go to a site like this. If you're Chinese, you're asked to present that. It's scanned or swiped, and um, then a record that, the f that you visited this cultural monument um, serves to enhance your social score. So there's a number that everyone has, like a credit score, but in terms of how well you're behaving. So your score goes up based on a variety of factors and algorithms that are designed to help encourage people to behave and show Han Chinese values. So for instance, going here, you may get a point or two or Mao's tomb. Or if you associate with people who have a higher score than you, your score goes up. If you associate with people with a lower score, your score goes down. If your score goes too low, you either can't buy things or you pay more for them. You can't travel. And if your score goes really low, you have to go to a re-education center. And you have to stay there until you've learned how to be good. On Chinese. Well, there's one in that scrapbook, and I wondered the same thing. I'm like, am I holding the ID of a dead person? Like, what? Don't you need this? The third generation, so I, presumably they can reissue them. I mean, they have quite a functional bureaucracy to handle those sort of things. However, the, the newest third generation ones have a chip that it talks wherever you're going, so it has location monitoring both to Skynet, which is the broad telecommunications network that's state controlled. And it also records all those movements in the card itself. What do you have to do besides visiting the uh, Imperial Palace to, to increase your score? What other things do people have to do? It's a good question. Um, we heard that on kind of the flip side of that, things, you know, like you saw the sign for not peeing and pooping here. So there's like, Using public restrooms, what obviously, or like, um, what would be some, like jaywalking. We, we heard stories about Sony jumbotrons being put up in seven test cities in the center of the city, enormous TV screens that would show people's pictures and would say whatever they did and how many points they lost to kind of help educate the public as to what the expectations are, or how they can keep their score from going down. Um, in terms of getting it to go up, I'm assuming it would probably be, again, I'm, these are just assumptions, but if you have, let's say, party doctrine or policy decisions, like we want to control the birth rate, or we, which they did for a long time, the one-child policy, um, or reduce global warming, then we have these expectations for you if you fulfill them, then presumably your score will go up, or is it, I'm guessing, or obviously not. It's the, a lot of it is the things you don't do. You don't interfere with police business. You don't speak out. You don't break the rules. Question? Yeah, yes. Um, did you see a disproportionate population problem there? Because when I spoke to young Chinese men, they say there aren't any young women. They either, the ones that survived were adopted by other countries, and that was a big problem. 
We wouldn't see it. I mean, I, I don't have the analytical to be able to look at a crowd and say there's a 5% disparity here. It's definitely mentioned. It is a real thing. It's been documented in a couple different places. Because of the one-child policy, having a son is really important to Chinese family. And you have four grandparents, two children, one child. So they have this problem where there's no one to care for the elders. And if you have to choose, a lot of people were choosing a boy which in some horrific circumstances led to female infanticide, which is now reflected in about um, a 10% difference in terms of the gender balance compared to everywhere else in the world. So about one in 20 Chinese men will have to either import a bride or kidnap or trafficking or revert or be singletons for their whole life. Um, so it's, it's 36 million, at least, are missing. Yep. Mm -hmm. oh, stray dunes. The dunes. So, okay, so this is kind of like, and this was like a cultural thing that I hadn't really appreciated. In Chinese culture, um, togetherness and like being part of a group is, is much more um, important than in Western culture where like personal identity and personal achievement and singularity is a great example would be if you show a Western crowd a picture of a person on a stage making a speech to a crowd, they generally the Westerners comments say, oh, she's thinking about, you know, how passionate she is about this subject that she's speaking about. And, you know, they'll, they'll mostly talk about the speaker. If you show the exact same picture to a Chinese audience, most of them will be talking about, well, this part of the crowd is really likes what she's saying, but these ones aren't so sure. So it's, it's a very sort of fundamental difference in terms of cultural norms. And this experience really showed us how different our American camping is from Chinese camping. So we went, we, we were like, let's try it. We, it was something I don't even remember. It was like at the desk of the hotel or something, camping, dune camping. So we went out and it's, huge tents like with stages and speakers and there's like I don't know seven or eight so it's very scalable so if they're busy they only open one but every time more people come they just open another one and another one and another one and another one all right next to each other and we you know did some karaoke and some games and then it was time for the campfire so they built this campfire and everybody came out and those are all their cell phone lights they're waving their cell phone lights and they're singing kumbaya basically the Chinese version and everybody's like so close together and we're like we're in this most incredible beautiful desert place why would you want to like look over here why why like literally just everybody wanted to be right together and it was just really kind of illustrated that cultural difference but we were still able to slip away in the morning for the sunrise and a little bit of solitude. <laughs> but she's the only one up there. Everyone else is like, no, why would we go up there? <laughs> Togetherness. You'll see this all the time, too. So these folks are either playing games or gambling is incredibly popular. And you'll just see groups of people sitting at tables all the time in streets on basically every other corner. People are just congregating. It's not a restaurant or a club. They're just being social, being together. That was uh, also the case here in a, in a park where there was a guy, you know, doing yo-yo, if you've seen with the strings, and, you know, Nick was kind of watching and was curious, and he was like, yeah, come on over, come on over, and spent like half an hour, like, showing him how to do it, and... Great Wall, and this is not at all uncommon. You'll see security cameras on pretty much every corner of every street, on every door of any transit center, bus stations, train stations, um, on every stoplight with a flashing strobe every time a car goes under it so they can capture the license plate who's in the car as much as they can on every single car or vehicle that passes through that intersection. Oops. That one. Oops was on the Great Wall, but you'll see those pretty much everywhere. So this is the Great Wall, and as I'm sure many of you know, there was hundreds of years worth of walls built. It was not just one wall, There's, they're all over the place, and they range in age over several hundred years to, with the intent of 
mostly keeping the Mongols from coming south. Uh, the problem is no matter how good any wall is, there's usually a door that you can bribe someone to open, which made these walls not very good at keeping Mong Mongols out, but really good at moving military soldiers and supplies. And you can see, and I'll sh there'll be a couple other slides here, but the, it'd be a lot easier to run a cart over this than this. Yeah. Or march troops, and you'll see the absence of stairs, even at steep inclines, because they were rolling things. There were horses and carts and military stuff going through there. And they would often use the ridge lines, like this ridge line here, you'd, you, wouldn't, you would expect where if they hadn't built it here, they often incorporate the natural geography as part of the wall. So it's much bigger when you build it kind of in the ridge or you block the valleys. In a popular attraction, again, surveillance. Outposts where, you know, garrisons where they could warm up or store food or as they were guarding the wall. These were some friends that took us out in, this was back out in the desert, and we, these were, one of them was our uh, hotel proprietor, and this was one of his friends. But they took us all around out into the desert, and this was where you saw sort of the mixing of Buddhism and Hinduism in this part of the country, much more like out in the center part. And we found there would, there would be, um, like the traders on the Silk Road, sometimes they'd just stop and they'd stay. And so then you had these monks and they would establish you know, monasteries and, and then they would bring tra you know, wayward travelers in and try to get them into religion or find spiritualism. This was a, like one of the many caves uh, here in these grottos that were, I don't know, hundreds, thousands of years old that people had carved and inside they had done some relief work. Nothing particularly sophisticated. But I put this slide in because I thought it was interesting that they were showcasing um, like female deities as well as instead of just the male Buddhist, the Buddha. Um, often these retreats were hidden. They weren't right on the Silk Road. You had to walk a couple days through a valley like this to get into them. We drove it. But as you're driving up through this valley, then you see this enormous golden Buddha sitting up in this mountain, um, sort of beckoning you, and you come in and you go in the door behind it, inside it, and there's all these beautiful frescoes and reliefs uh, painted inside the Buddha. And it's, there's no one there. You know, no, it's like abandoned. There's maybe one or two people driving up and down, but I just really like, you know, each of these characters is, you know, rich with symbolism and, you know, the, there's probably a story I'm not, you know, and don't know enough about Chinese culture, but these paintings are just very, very rich in terms of meaning. And not defaced in any way? Um, you could see, like, they're just, some of them are just not being very well maintained, like see here on the wall, like in damage that's either water or, but generally, no. No, people don't. Maybe here. Um, not, not really, no. And as we got further and further up, there were a few people that were living up in these old monasteries, and they're still probably you know, an ethnic minority. But our, uh, this is much the way life was prior to all the advancements with they're literally drying their food, which is corn, on the ground. That's their water supply. Here again, Hindu influences with the multiple arms of Vishnu and some of the statues. A couple artistic objects, again, incredibly rich art in China. They're very into ceramics and fine artwork, incredible craftsmen and women. This is a ceramic camel in a museum that we went to. Most of this, the ceramics in this museum were, and again, it was pretty much lost on me, but this, they basically had invented glaze, and they were, this was like the first time anything ever got glazed. And even though it's pretty crude by our standards today, it was really quite groundbreaking at the time. Paintings and artwork, of course, are amazing. And these are the karsts. So if you've seen the movie Avatar, 
um, that was sort of the idea was from this. And there are these large, huge spires um, that come up out of the ground. Very popular tourist destination for obvious reasons. It's just incredibly beautiful and vast. And what we discovered here was that um, there were a lot of people that wanted to see this. But I would say 99% of the Chinese wanted to come in and, and take a tram or a bus or something that didn't involve walking to where they could get on a place to look at it and then leave or go to a couple via some other tram or sky car or something that was going to help them with that. And we would, we got off with these masses of people like that line from the train and we're like, whoa, whoa, it's like so overwhelming. The noise of like all these people just and then they'll come right to where there's all this food and everyone's eating and eating and throwing everything on the ground and they're rushing off to the tram and we're like, oh, is it going to be like this the whole time? Well, we walked a little bit further past where the tram was and there's, I don't know, hundreds of miles of beautiful trails and there's no one. And all of a sudden we go around the corner and it's quiet and we're like, this is great. And we would pass a lot of Westerners and Europeans and occasionally Asians, but they are not interested in so much. This isn't about the butterfly. It's about the railing. And they had built all of these. This is all cement. So it's meant to look like wood. Not, there's another slide coming up. But all of these trails have hundreds of miles of cement made to look like wood railings. But you can hike all around these valleys and take in the beauty of the karsts. And <laughs> there are wild monkeys there. And it's pretty well set up for foreigners as well. This, all the signage is, has English so that if you read English, you can navigate the park quite easily. But this is another example of one of these paths. But it's all cement. And you can see some of the detail. They, they really did take, you know, they must have, can only imagine how many hours it took because they, they sculpted in all the knots and all the sort of imperfections and the grain of the wood. They would, yeah, everything. It was, and these are the karst fields. Did you see much wildlife? Generally, no. Ch and again, this is a generalization, but Chinese will eat anything that walks, swims, crawls, flies. And so songbirds, all these things have just been eaten. There's, there, and there's, there are reserves and preserves, but not many. It, you really start to realize how small the world really is becoming once you get up in the numbers of billion plus people wanting to eat every day. Um, so more natural landforms and some caves that we went down into. Cave feature. This was a piece of an illustration uh, from the train station that has the genie, you know, from out by the Silk Road that I just kind of caught me. And same with this one. It's this, uh, you know, sort of mystical idea of the genie. The jinn is, is real to them, or at least it's there in that. Sorry. And here we are at the Terracotta Warriors. So Michelle and I had been here um, again on our previous trip, but we wanted the kids to see it. And it turned out that the most interesting thing here in this uh, rather large pit, some of which is still being exhumed. You can see these are all just fried. This is what it looks like before they dig it up. And then they dig it up, and it looks like this. And then they put them all back together. Um, but it was more, and you can, this picture shows the building. So this is like sort of an aircraft hangar building with a dome roof to keep water from destroying the ruins because there's huge historical significance here. And then there's uh, a little walkway that goes all the way around the pits. Uh, probably room for about six deep is the width of this walkway. Now we happen to go on one of their national holidays and because of the increased affluence many 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 hundreds of millions of Chinese can now afford to travel and of course the Terracotta Warriors is on their list of places to go too. But this facility really only accommodates about 60,000 people a day. So beginning in the f when it first opens at 8 in the morning or wherever, it is like a mosh pit. It's packed, just, just completely packed to the point where we had to literally grab the kids, 
And if they wanted to like stand here and look down into like the kind of prime viewing of the area, the burial area, we would have to literally like fight and force our way up to the very, very, very front. And the selfie sticks, the, the cell phone sticks are like whacking and everyone's trying to like get closer and closer and closer to the edge. Uh, we couldn't believe it. We were just, I mean, it, and it, you'd look around and occasionally you'd see a Western and, and you kind of, it just was like, wow. Like, you, it's just amazing. So many people want to go there that they built an entire replica of this so that if you can't get in the real one, you can go to another one that looks just like it. But if you don't want to do that either, they also have dozens and dozens and dozens of selfie stations where you'll have like a warrior and the horse and the archer and then like it says terracotta warriors and you stand there and you take your selfie and then just leave. So because so many people want to go and most some of them don't either they don't want to spend the time or battle the crowds and so they'll just do that instead. And they're still building, you know, these are more. And now we come to the pandas. So this was in Chandu, China, and they have an amazing panda breeding center. They have more live births and better stable panda populations than anywhere else in the world. Genetic diversity, they've done an incredible job with their program there. Um, and the city is quite proud of that. You can see the right above the Prada store, pretty much have all the prime European brands in every major city for sure. And here they are, they're cute little buggers for sure. They are some of the most charismatic, just goofy, funny, you can't help but love them. They're just amazing. Again, well visited site. You would, people would kind of, as they would come in and out of their shelters, you'd, there'd be crowd, you know, you'd be rushing in these crowds to try to get to where you could see them. And again, uh, well set up for um, foreign tourists. Just really cute, just adorable. That's a baby and its mother. She was kind of like kept nudging the mom and she kind of eventually it's like started to fall. But it was just <laughs> and the red panda was one that I never really knew about. So this is a cousin and they have a big long tail and they can climb really good. And the enclosures were really nicely set up with a fair amount of natural habitat and open space where people weren't allowed so that you could kind of get the experience of seeing one not just like on stage but in a forest. And then we made a little diversion into a river city. So this was a historic city that had served as a trade port and we were staying kind of up in a little place like that or maybe something like that. And so the, the river came right through and just a beautiful, you know, kind of a, it was a, it was, it's like a living replica. It's maintained for tourists um, and well frequented. That kind of captures the feeling of that village. And you can go for boat rides and restaurants. And Karst's out of place. Costumes are big, so either people posing in historic costumes or we saw a lot of people renting costumes and then walking around the sites dressed up like that. And they would have other people taking pictures and that was pretty common. Dunes, and this is the this is the bus. This is where you would get on all of these bays, or for buses that pull up and take people to and from this area. And that line goes again way back that way. But beautiful, you know, scenery, natural. Once you get away from the crowds, you find things like this: well-maintained paths and just a lot of natural beauty. This is the, um, the key for the, all of the other non-walking surfaces, the trams and air cars, and might look like this. 
get an evening shot of the River City. This was some hiking up in some of the mountains in China. Public exercise stations are huge, so you'll see them in every city where there'll be like an outdoor gym with maybe 15 or 20, 25 pieces of equipment um, that all involve motion and coordination and they're well used. So people, it's totally normal to um, do public singing, public dancing in groups, um, public exercising with just a bunch of random strangers, sort of like a gym but outside and free. Absolutely. In the park, yep. Yep. Exercising and, and stretching and, like I said, singing. And their parks are really very beautiful. So they, they take a lot of care in the aesthetics of the parks so that if you're, as in many cities, you know, retreating from a very urban environment, you would not be uncommon to see scenes like this with beautiful willow trees and bridges and um, also featuring. Uh, minerals and unique rocks like this is pretty typical that you'd have some sort of just really strange natural form. They didn't make that, it's looked like that and they brought it there to to display it for aesthetics. This is a, the sign at the facility just to kind of help orient you to what to do and what not to do. And boating, you know, and anywhere where there's water and rivers, much like here, people like to, you know, float, paddle around a little bit. Um, of course, the parks are surrounded by miles and miles of that. But they really do a nice job with their parks. Decorative flower displays, too, are big in parks. So they'll spend a lot of time and energy, you know, creating things like this out of flowers. And this texture seemed to be kind of a feature in gardens, beautiful floral and botanical gardens. A lot of care and pride goes into that. This, we were, we were, I mentioned singing, Nick and I were in this park and there was just a group of people who were just, you know, singing together and just, we were just sitting listening to the music. And public walking, it's a big thing too. So this is like a, a, a wall around the city, but they've opened up the whole top of it and you can just walk, people will do it all the time, or ride bikes just to go out and exercise. Very, very health conscious. Chinese are very conscientious of like, getting too hot or being too cold and what you're eating is really important and your exercise, your yin and your yang and qi and traditional medicine is, is a huge thing. And this is us doing laundry on the rooftop, pretty typical. Um, they're also adopting a lot of Western traditions. This was a tiramisu cake being made at a pay, in a pastry shop, um, a birthday cake that we got for Annika and was just like anything you'd find in Europe or here, um, and priced accordingly. Um, again, the sort of uh, indicative of the, not only are, oops, our people have pets, but they have pet clothing, and so you can imagine the industries that come, much like our pet industry, uh, where to service your animals. This is a, uh, a fish foot spa, um, so you can uh, pay and put your feet in there and fish nibble the dead skin off your feet. Is that somebody you know? Uh, I don't think so. We, did we do, I don't think we did that. We did it at Maidstone in Vermont. Right. <laughs> <laughs> and public parks where, you know, roller coaster rides and all of roller balls, you can rent all sorts of things to very much first world. This shot I put in, again, it's the translation software on a Huawei phone. And I put this shot in because it became clear that with the surveillance state's reach that people, if you raise the wrong topics on these translations, they get, they just shut the phone off because it's all recorded, it's all tracked, it's all associated to them, and they don't want to have anything to do with any sort of questions about, well, what's that building over there, or who, what do they do over there, nothing like that. Good. Uh, this is, I guess we're kind of getting towards the conclusion here in terms of lifestyle. I already mentioned, this is a picture of us, but animal protein is abundant and consumed in, by everyone now. 
as well our you know um, global delicacies like sushi is common now in China. Mm. Nature, beauty, there's still many things there to see. A little bit of work to do on some of their infrastructure, as is the case in much of the world. Uh, this is some flooding on the banks of the river, the um, Yangtze River. These are a couple of those morphed sculptures. I was talking about this blending of form, and um, these appear to be human form with animal head, and these are, I don't know, nine or 900 or more years old. So just this sort of fascination with this, you see, the, you find these things all over the world, and you sort of wonder, like, well, why did they make, well, who made that? Is it just their imagination, or? And that is the end of China. So we're at 8 o'clock. I guess I've gone on a little longer just with China than I would have liked. I wasn't sure how long that was going to take. We're on our way to Nepal. Do, you, do folks want to take a break? Do we want to keep going? Do you want to call it? I, I'm not sure how this works. Should we take five? Do people want to get up and stretch or go to the bathroom or keep going? I, I'm okay. I just want to make sure everyone's comfortable. And Okay. Yeah, please don't. You're not going to hurt my feelings at all if you need to go or want to go. This has gone on a lot longer than I thought I would, so. That was in Nepal. Yeah. I think what I'm going to do is I'm, do people want me to just go right to Nepal or do you, should I do yeah. Cambodia and Nepal? Because Nepal is of interest. I'll go there. So Nepal, this is in the airplane flying from Tibet over the Himalayas into Nepal. Um, Nepal has a much lower uh, per capita GDP of just over $1,000, so quite a poor country. Um, and comparatively, in terms of the velocity of change, had changed a lot less than some of the other places like China or Cambodia that we went to. That said, um, we initially were thinking about, um, Michelle and I had trekked the Annapurna circuit back in 2000 and thought that might be a place where we'd take the kids and subsequently learned that when we got to Kathmandu that it had been paved. So the entire 21-day loop was now a four-lane road full of buses. So it is happening. It's, it's happening incredibly quickly. This We decided then to reconsider that we didn't have much interest in taking a diesel bus to the top of the world. And um, so we were talking about it as a family. And Annika and Nick were like Everest. It's got to be Everest, Everest, Everest. So we're like, I had some concerns on the first, the, you know, is it expense, the price, the safety, the how logistically, how does this? So Nicholas and I spent the next five days on the roof of the hotel with pencil and paper and planning and thinking it out and figuring out how we could make it work. and. At the end of the day, those two kids led us up to Everest Base Camp. So this is um, some photos of that. This is their transportation. Uh, rickshaws is the parts yard, but it's um, either um, walking, 
This would be their version of a um, you know, pickup truck. That's a functional rickshaw, so it's human powered and you sit in it and they pedal you around. Uh, they certainly, you can see they have cars and motorcycles as well, but it's not uncommon to, or walking, of course, is an option. Um, this would be a, more like a tractor trailer truck. That's a yak and you'll see all the um, propane cylinders here that are being carried up to altitude. <clears throat> and smaller loads of uh, provisions. Um, Helicopters can only go to a certain altitude. Uh, planes also struggle and visibility is terrible in the mountains and the winds. It's just not really a safe environment to be traveling by air. So unless you have a paved road, you know, we all kind of groaned about that paved road, but the person who lives up there doesn't really want to walk 10 days to get their rice every day. So they, or carry the 50 pound bag back 10 days once they get it. So you kind of can understand why they might want a road. Donkey caravans, also a big part of how things are moved around, um, can get a little tricky when you're trying to come the other direction. <laughs> um, Jeeps like this, these are Indian made Jeeps and they break, well that was the least, <laughs> I'll tell you some Jeep stories. Uh, generally and fairly, barely, barely functional vehicles and just constantly breaking down. But there's a, you know, a strong community, everybody helps each other and take part off mine or give you a jump or we all stand there and look at it. And, and Kathmandu is their biggest city. Um, last time we were there was about a million people, now it's about four million. A uh, big influx in um, poor Indians coming north to find work as, you know, instead of earning a dollar a day on the farm, they can earn five dollars a day washing dishes or carrying bags. Um, which has led to huge urban sprawl. You'll notice in Nepal cities, three, four stories, maybe five stories is the highest they're going to go. They don't have proper cement quality or engineering to have safe buildings plus earthquakes, um, but there's no skyscrapers there. Um, and you're almost always in the shadow of a mountain somewhere. You can't see it from Kathmandu, but as you get higher in altitude, um, this is sort of what towns look like. So cobblestone streets and buildings made of stone um, to accommodate mostly tourists. We're on, you know, probably the most popular trekking route in the world, so. Um, it's mostly all tourists going up and down that trail. And this is sort of what a city might look like. And occasionally you'll find a city like this that's mostly empty. It's been financed and built by Sherpas in the off season. And they're all at work when we're there. So it's pretty much, or their families have gone down to Kathmandu, but they'll build, they'll, you know, they'll build things like this. Um, and then it's also, as we came, we came up through the lowlands, so we didn't fly in. We took a Jeep and then hiked in. And if you get off the Everest trek, you're going to see a lot more stuff that looks like this. Um, this is Kathmandu again, and you can see the big stupa there on the top of the hill. Um, they have a lot of plastic waste. Uh, ramen noodles are very popular, and you can imagine maybe one meal a day, the four million people eat the ramen out of the package, throw it on the ground. Pretty quickly, pretty much everywhere, there's a foot or two feet of dirty plastic from a variety of basically food packaging mostly, um, which then start to like block the roads and people moving, so they scrape it all together and burn it, which is why the air quality is the way it is. Um, but once you get out of Kathmandu, it's obviously incredibly beautiful and cleaner. This is in Namche Bazaar. And not uncommon to see animals in the streets and along with everybody else. Kathmandu again. Yeah. At night. And from the rooftop. So cisterns, you know, pretty much everybody has a water cistern to supply their building with water. And this is sort of a typical trail in the lowlands, and these go somewhat sequentially. So we're going to start down around 5,000 feet and end around 18,000 feet at base camp, and then turn around and come back down down obviously goes a lot faster. So you're kind of hiking through uh, forested low, you know, mountains, but not like high altitude mountains. So you'll st still see trees here. Um, things are fairly green. Um, there's water. And there is also the ever present uh, mule and yak trains. Yaks mostly just used at higher altitude. Um, but you can see humans carrying heavy loads as well. 
and just tons of like Sanskrit tablets and symbolism everywhere you're on this trail. Like every village you come to will have piles of these tablets, which you're, um, if you want to keep your good luck, not fall off the trail or get hurt or you want to get where you're going, you always walk around them counterclockwise when you come to one. So if, even if you're going that way and you see one, you stop and you go around it and then you keep going. This is the uh, security at the airfield <laughs> on our way up into Lukla. And the kids, so we made a decision in that planning session not to use any guides or porters, um, just to follow the path ourselves. We knew it would be pretty easy to follow the trail. And that the children would carry their own uh, stuff and water. We didn't have to bring in our food because all these uh, buildings, this is, these are mostly tea houses, so they serve Simple food. Tradition, the standard fare is uh, what they call dal bat. It's rice, lentils, a pompadom, maybe some pickled vegetables. Um, and that's pretty much, you don't really want to eat meat because there's no refrigeration and they have to carry it. So the further you get from the trailhead, the worse your odds are <laughs> in terms of. So we basically went vegetarian for 26 days straight on the trail. No, that was another part of the planning is every day that you hike uphill, prices go up about 50% wow. because somebody had to carry it an extra day so you can eat it. <laughs> and it's just the way it is. It's, yeah. so, so you start out paying like 25 cents and by the end you're paying like $20. Wow. So we had to sort of figure out how much cash do we need because there's no ATMs, there's no, you can, and then take it out and max withdraw, max withdraw, max withdraw and Kathmandu and then you're trying to like hide it in your shoe to like, and uh, so that we could make it. The bridge. Uh, did we have a little one maybe people had? Nothing that really stopped us. Sore throat, no diarrhea, dysentery, but I credit eating rice and lentils the whole time because they have other stuff on the menu, but you know. And there's still people flying, you know, for tours or getting as close as they can or trying to get further up the trail. Again, we elected to kind of do part of the Tenzeg Norgay section from lower altitude. So these guys were kind of cruising over pretty regularly. This is the types of bridges, suspension bridges that we would cross regularly to get across rivers. And thank goodness, because going all the way down there and then all the way back up here. <laughs> Sure saves a lot of time, but it's kind of scary because they're like wobbly and then the donkey train starts coming across. It's like, yeah. yeah. The rivers are all glacially fed, so they've got this beautiful blue, like that's not a Photoshop, it has this sort of almost iridescent blue tone to the water. And, you know, just taking a break, trailside to drink water. We brought a filter because Plastic waste is not only incredibly expensive to buy bottled water, but you're generating all this garbage, which then someone's got to either burn or carry back down. So we just had a, like a small Swiss water purifier, and every day we would pump and fill. Let's see if I can see one in this picture. Yeah, maybe just on the side of Nick's bag there. You'll, they'll show up in a picture, but just reuse the same one-liter bottle the entire time or pick one up at a lodge someone else had finished with. Okay. You bet. Okay. Well, it looks like we're getting um, out. <laughs> shut down. But thank you guys for. Um, you must come back. Thank yeah. you. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks. <laughs> Folks have questions about stuff they've seen tonight or. We started below Lukla, but about four days downhill from there, well, down and uphill, and it was 26 in total. So uh, very limited showers, very limited diet every day, walking uphill until you get there and then back Where down again. Tea houses, so they have bunks in there, unheated. Very little oxygen. Once you get above like 15,000 feet, it really becomes pretty serious. And um, we did take Diamox the last couple days, which is a a pharmaceutical that can help you with your blood um, oxygen levels. But it's, you, you take, you basically, you take three steps, 
10 breaths, three steps, repeat, repeat, repeat. Uh, not very. It, um, there's no one there this time of year in the fall. Almost all the expeditions go up in the spring. Um, so there was a couple tents. There was eh, maybe 20 tourists that had made that specific trek to get there. I was surprised at how many people um, had like signs and just to get to base camp, they had like planned their whole life for this thing. We just sort of went up there. <laughs> We didn't. I just wore like a pair of leather boat shoes yeah. and we got down coats because it does get colder and colder the higher and higher you go. Um, we, we rented down sleeping bags in Kathmandu before we left so they're like a high quality down mummy bags and you were never warm until you were asleep and then you woke up and you did not want to get out of that sleeping bag. <laughs> because then you had to get dressed and you only had two pairs of clothes and you can't wash them because they would just freeze. <laughs> and there's no water. <laughs> yes, sir. Um, we mostly when we would travel outside of cities, which we, we travel exclusively overland. So we didn't do a lot of internal flights in China. And I mostly I have memories of like, for instance, two or three hours of driving past stone sheds, stone sheds, tile, blocks of rock, the, 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 on both sides of the road for two hours straight. So the whole world's tile is getting cut and made in that little section. So the amount of like factories, like there's whole cities that just make zippers and buttons and fasteners for the whole world. It's, and every time there's a new product, and I, this is kind of heavy, but they'll build a giant coal burning, well they'll build a railroad, then they'll build a coal power plant. You could see it when you go, you'll see, oh there's a giant pit, and then you'd see another pit with a half built power plant, and then you'd drive a couple hundred miles. Away. There's the power plant, and here's the cement factory which, because it has power now, they make the cement to build those 25-story buildings, housing for 500,000, a million, million and a half, whatever they think they're going to need. <laughs> then they bring the residents in, because they have to move them out of the hutong, put them in a brand new apartment, brand new city. It's really efficient, because you don't have to retrofit and dig up streets. You just do it all at once before anyone even lives there. Then you decide the factory that you need in that to produce whatever it is that you want. It could be hoverboards or whatever the new thing is that we need a world's worth of for every co everyone and then they start making that and that's it and then they do it again and again and again it's uh, very eye-opening other questions thank you, yeah you bet thank you guys for coming so much <laughs>